very successful conference on uh, nuclear proliferation issues. Uh, then next fall, uh, as some of you are students, uh, this year, as you recall, we did All Under Heaven, which kind of raised information warfare issues right in the first week. So you can think we will try to put together a BW exercise uh, in the first week of school to raise uh, student awareness of some of these issues. So all of these things are part of a uh, curriculum support uh, effort here at the college. Uh, and it just couldn't be done without Barry. So Barry, our guest. And you'd like to know where, where you fit into the larger universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are we in the light for a minute? Um, we're very lucky today to have Brad Roberts from the Institute of Defense Analysis. Um, known Brad for a little while, a couple of years, um, several visits to Washington. He is a recognized expert uh, in the DC community and in the United States on uh, uh, chemical and biological warfare issues. Um, Brad uh, is working on chemical liberation issues, and in particular, he's a chemical and biological weapons yes. warfare specialist. Um, and he's done this for a number of years. He was the former editor of the Washington Quarterly for about six years. Uh, well, he spent a dozen years at uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, working on CBW issues. Uh, prior to that, he was at uh, Congressional Research Service, where he cut his teeth on CW issues. And, uh, so we're very pleased to have you, Brad, uh, spend a couple hours with us. Uh, Brad will be here until roughly 5 o'clock when we have to head to the airport. So if anybody afterwards would like to spend a little more time asking questions or having discussions, so there's a little more time on our formal time here. But rather than cut into his time, let me just introduce a couple of things that he's produced. He produced a CSIS book, uh, Biological Weapons, Weapons of the Future, a few years ago. Was that 1993? which I have used previously in the proliferation course uh, prior to this year. And now I understand that he has just edited another book, Terrorism and Chemical and Biological Weapons, which has just come out. Um, uh, and this was put out by Mike Moody's um, uh, Center in Washington, D.C. on Chemical and Biological Arms Control, Chemical and Biological Arms Control Institute in Alexandria, Virginia. I'll pass these around if you want to take a look, uh, just give you a taste of what Brad has done. And uh, rather than cut into his time, I'll just turn it over to Brad. Thank you, Barry. Uh, thank all of you for your interest and uh, the time this afternoon. I do have a few slides, which I will uh, start with in a, in a moment or two. Um, and basically, I will talk, I, might, I understand my mandate is to lay about 30 minutes of uh, ideas out on the table, and then we just open it up and up for general discussion. Um, by way of uh, welcoming all of you to the BW subject, uh, I might tell just a short story about the uh, bat book making the rounds, the blue one, the one that's three years old. Uh, the genesis of that, I think, is a telling one for this field, which is after the Persian Gulf War, then chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Les Aspen, uh, felt that the NBC component of that war comes as a surprise. And here he was the guy in the Congress who had taken such a strong interest in regional war and proliferation issues, and yet this was a, a wake-up call. So he composed a little study group from members of the committee, three of them, uh, and uh, asked them to go out and educate themselves and, and issue a report that the rest of the committee could use to educate themselves about <coughs> particularly the chemical and biological problems. Well, this group and their associated staff made the rounds, uh, CIA, DIA, et cetera, and found lots of people willing to talk to them about the chemical subject, and lots of information available to them, lots of opinion, lots of congressional testimony, lots of defense preparations, uh, lots of attitudes and orientations from allies to consider. And then the biological subject, all they could get was the DIA threat brief. Uh, and either there wasn't opinion and information and an analysis to be had, or people were withholding it. Uh, and they, uh, I had a prior uh, relationship with uh, 
two of those members in a study group that I've been running on chemical weapons issues. And so they asked if we could be helpful. And uh, I tried to set up a symposium on the biological subject and encountered exactly what they had encountered. And so the, then called uh, the head of the British chemical and biological defense establishment, a fellow who likes to be on the public record and is effective on the record, and was delighted to accept an invitation to come and talk to an American audience about these problems, and then was able to shame the rest of the American audience into <coughs> coming and participating in this. And, and this little book was the result. Uh, but this is symptomatic of a problem that's either been treated as too hard, as too um, secret, if you will. Our vulnerabilities are so great, and our understanding of the problem so weak that it's better to just uh, keep it all at the, at the hyper-classified and inaccessible level. And, and a problem that's been very much under the shadow of the nuclear history and experience and models and all that we invoke to understand uh, weapons of mass destruction. And we made a little bit of headway with this book, uh, but in the interim, the problem has only gotten much worse. Uh, and there are a lot of organizations today trying to get themselves up to speed. Uh, and you will find in the next few months as you sample the thinking and uh, expertise of other organizations uh, that that expertise is not always very high, uh, that a lot of us are essentially stumbling around trying to, come, trying to think through problems completely afresh, uh, perhaps uh, not always uh, to the best effect, but this is a problem that's new unfamiliar and uh, in need of new analysis and salient uh, not least because it's a real problem uh, and likely to be uh, a more real problem than any of us would like to think. Uh, I have a particular approach to the presentation today that I'd like to adopt rather than mesmerize you with uh, the technical esoterica of different threat agents and the quantities of agents and the quantities and volumes needed to uh, inflict uh, casualties in various target areas and talk about uh, some of the other topics that you're likely to get into in more depth along the way. What I'd like to do is, is uh, stand back and ask some basic questions. Uh, and This is a project that I'm currently engaged in, so it's entirely a speculative endeavor, uh, and I welcome the dialogue with you all as a way to refine the thinking and lines of argument. Uh, the presentation begins with a few key definitions uh, that goes on to the following question. Why would an aggressor use these weapons? And answering that question, how would he then choose to do so? What would be the effects of that use, political and military operational? What is the agenda of defense preparedness that makes sense to meet these challenges, these particular challenges? And lastly, how do we think about the problem of integrating military preparations for biological warfare into the larger U.S. strategy, anti-BW strategy. Where does where do military preparations fit? So with that, uh, with that opening in mind, let me just proceed to... <coughs> there was an old BW threat. Perhaps I should begin with the last bullet first. Now there was an old BW threat. Uh, there's an interesting new book coming out from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute that chronicles the BW preparations, offensive as well as defensive, of each of the major parties to the Second World War. It's a history, it's a survey of the experience 1926 to 1947. And what it indicates is that each of the major powers and some of the minor ones were preparing themselves to wage biological warfare. Uh, not all of them got very close. Uh, but this is a reminder that uh, biological weapons aren't just a new problem. There was also a Cold War vintage BW problem in the Soviet threat and a Chinese threat. Uh, I should say, by the way, that this is, I'm doing all of this at the unclassified level. This is all on the public record information. Uh, and this is in part an effort to break out of the old way of, of talking about these issues. Um, but a couple of key definitions first. Toxin weapons are chemical substances produced by living organisms. Uh, 
they tend to be faster acting than infectious diseases and readily, easily produced with the new biotechnologies that are uh, being produced for legitimate commercial purposes. There is an important difference in biological agents between contagious and non-contagious. Uh, obviously, if you're unleashing a disease like uh, AIDS or Ebola that might spread for years or decades, well, Ebola won't spread for years and decades, it kills its hosts too quickly, but AIDS that will spread for literally decades, if not centuries, before it's brought back under control. Uh, that's different from an agent that merely infects, but isn't contagious to others. Uh, that's an important difference when it comes to an aggressor's thinking about uh, using these things in a neighboring country. If the neighboring country is separated by a big body of water, like the transatlantic ocean, maybe that's just fine, a contagious agent. Uh, if it's not, you're not likely to use that. And there are important differences between lethal and non-lethal agents. It's possible to make a lot of people sick with the flu, for example, as a way to illustrate that you can make them sick with worse things, if you'd like to. Uh, proliferation trends. The United States produced biological weapons, possessed an, uh, uh, an offensive capability until 1969. The Nixon administration renounced the right to use biological weapons, unilaterally destroyed its stockpile of weapons uh, for a variety of reasons, secured a commitment from the Soviet Union to do the same, and this was the basis for them, the multilateral arms control treaty, the biological and toxin weapons which entered into force in 1975. Now at the time, if you go back and read the NSC documents in 69, they were talking about maybe two or three other states at the most that had biological weapons. But one of the good reasons to get out of the business, if we didn't have a strong need for biological weapons, was to, um, to not encourage others to get into the business. If, we, if our offensive program was highly visible and modernizing and uh, being tested, then uh, this, would, <coughs> this would stimulate proliferation. And proliferation was a real fear at the time. But it was seen to be an abstract problem. Now, how valid the intelligence assessments were at the time, we have no way to gauge. Uh, the rule of thumb today is that there are about a dozen countries that are detected as having either a stockpile of biological weapons or an active program aimed at creating such a stockpile, or a surge production capability that would generate a stockpile in time of war or near war. What countries are those? Well, there is no public list. Uh, those publicly identified by the U.S. government uh, officials speaking in various capacities uh, include the likely suspects. Uh, North Korea, Syria, Iraq, Iran, uh, some debate in, in the public information about uh, India-Pakistan, whether they're only interested in the defensive side or the offensive side. Uh, China has been publicly mentioned by the head of the CIA. Russia, uh, Yeltsin himself has acknowledged that uh, he has been unable to close down as fully as he might have liked the program that he inherited and that went on all the way through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, despite the statements of the Soviet. Um, this is a slippery number, and it's a slippery intelligence problem. Uh, it's probably impossible, uh, except in those cases where an aggressor has gone out and stockpiled a lot of weapons, uh, very visibly demonstrated, or developed, tested, and stockpiled delivery systems, tried to crack the problem of, uh, of dispersing BW agent, which is a difficult problem. Producing the agent is not difficult, dispersing it effectively and the size is necessary to get into your lungs and do the job, that's harder. Um, it may be that there are a lot more countries. It may be that there are, that relatively few of those countries actually have weapons. It may be that no one has gotten into this business in the last decade or two. And that rather these are countries that have been in this business all through the Cold War, stuck between the United States and the Soviet Union, looking for an escape <coughs> other than nuclear ones that they couldn't find. The intelligence simply doesn't support uh, a flat statement like 
well, there are 12 countries with VW weapons. Uh, and the intelligence, frankly, is not likely to ever be a lot better. Um, now, part of this proliferation picture has to be the underlying diffusion of the technology and materials and expertise suitable to the production of agents and to the delivery of those agents. Uh, whether you want to emphasize the availability of the basic recipes on the internet or in the hands of a nice little handbook produced by Uncle Fester, who's a kook who lives in the Oregon mountains, who sells these handbooks at uh, handgun shows around the United States, um, hinting at the interest of the militia movement and DW agents. Uh, whether you want to emphasize the gene engineering techniques that are now practiced in many different industries and universities around the world. These are all germane. This is not the nuclear problem. This is not a problem where you need a huge infrastructure, a lot of money, long lead times to produce strategic leverage weaponry. And it's a capability in terms of materials, technology, and expertise that's going to exist in any developing economy, to say nothing of developed ones. Uh, so that's just a little uh, background. Now, why might a state use these agents? This tells us, this begins to give us a handle on how they, they might be used. Well, the simple rule of thumb here is that uh, this all has something to do with the particular strategic circumstance that these countries find themselves in today, which is if they contemplate aggression regionally, they also have to contemplate the possibility or the likelihood of confronting the United States militarily. That's most obviously true in those places where we have formal security guarantees, but it's obviously not limited to that. And in thinking through that particular military challenge, how do you take on the United States in an international coalition and either win with your aggression intact or at least escape with your regime intact, uh, this is the problem of so-called asymmetric strategies. Uh, and these are, uh, history amply demonstrates that asymmetric strategies work sometimes. Uh, it's, of course, uh, a not unknown feature of history that weaker states defeat stronger ones. Uh, our recent history includes uh, a good example of that. Uh, and these are strategies that pit the strengths of the so-called weaker state against the weaknesses of the so-called stronger one. And in this particular context where we're talking about essentially a rogue state employing NBC weapons or threats or VW weapons and threats, uh, the strengths of that state are its risk-taking willingness, uh, its reputation for ruthlessness, and a willingness to play outside of the rules, to use banned weapons, to do things that shock people. It's the shock value, after all, that a rogue exploits. And uh, our weaknesses and converse are our ostensible casualty aversion. I suspect we could have a long debate about how actually casualty averse the American public is. Uh, I happen to think this is a myth that we would be well served by um, this, this, uh, this proving, if that's the right word. Uh, our, another weakness is this, this supposed weakness is the CNN factor in American politics, the ability to magnify any small incident and do something with huge <coughs> political repercussions. And lastly, the fact that both the U.S. decision to use force and the coalition's strategy are captives of democratic politics. You have to have public will. You have to have consensus. The president can't go out like Saddam Hussein and say, well, whatever my public thinks, I'm going to do X. That's very hard in our society. So that's the kind of dynamic that uh, that the um, aggressor finds itself in today. There are, I think, seven strategic imperatives that flow from this view of their predicament. Uh, the first of these is to dissuade formation of a coalition around our leadership in the hope that they can thus secure their aggression by crippling us either politically or militarily. Uh, if this fails to deter, well, it's a logical instance. If this fails to deter, to deter the coalition from taking military action and thereby also securing aggression, if 
this fails, I mean, I, I suppose I, I mean, you can all read that uh, perfectly well, and I think the camera captures it, right? Um, but there's a, these are the first four strategic imperatives. They're, they're in some sense political and in some sense military. Uh, they aim at crippling a co coalition and or denying it the ability to bring its full military potential to bear. The aggressor is going to lose a straight up conflict, so you've got to play by the rules. The remaining three on the list. now is work through uh, a particular line of argument here about the utility of BW for these strategic imperatives. Relative, I mean, the, the typical BW hack, frankly, will come in and write off, say, well, BW is good for all of those things, and I'll really scare the bejesus out of a lot of people. Well, it's not quite that simple from the point of view of the aggressor. The aggressor sits inside a military capability that's got a bunch of different pieces to it. Uh, conventional, or probably chemical, maybe nuclear, or at least some ability to make nuclear-based threats, and perhaps biological. And in relative terms, how is the biological asset going to look? Well, for those seven strategic imperatives, conventional weapons are likely to be able to achieve relatively few and arguably not. Uh, there are probably things that uh, Iraq might have been able to do conventionally. There might well be things that an Iran could do conventionally uh, in the future. Um, but not, very, not to accomplish very many of those seven strategic objectives. Chemical weapons probably offer a little bit more. Uh, and uh, particularly against, uh, you know, we tend to dismiss these weapons although you live closer to some who don't than a lot of rest of the community concerned with these things. But the typical perception of chemical weapons in the hand of a regional aggressor is that they don't matter. Well, that's not quite true. Uh, for a lot of those purposes, they might be very useful. If what you want to do is threaten an, uh, the, the population of a state that might or might not become a coalition member, uh, well, BW, uh, CW threats are very credible for that purpose. And if you actually need to conduct an attack to demonstrate your resolve, uh, a very small quantity of chemical warfare agent delivered against an unprotected civilian population will kill a lot of people. Uh, so for some of those dissuasive purposes, if you're trying to convince an opposing political leader to uh, not sign up with the coalition, or if you're trying to get uh, uh, Japan to deny basing rights to the United States, uh, CW might be as effective as some of these other means, if not more so. Uh, but of course, for the, for the uses related to actually inflicting military defeat on the, the intervening force, CW is much harder to use to good effect. Uh, which is to say, if there are, which is a big if, but if there are a suitable mix of active and passive protection measures, uh, then this requires of the aggressor that he have uh, an order of magnitude or more chemical agent than uh, he might have thought necessary, and um, precise delivery systems and uh, some ability to exploit the operational opportunities created by the CW use. So I, I don't want to say this is an inconsequent, but I mean, the aggressor may well look at his chemical weapon and think that they're going to be good for some of those purposes but not all. Nuclear weapons might also be seen as useful, even a few of them, even one or two. If what you want to do, if you're in North Korea, you want to dissuade uh, Japan from giving basing rights to the United States, that might be seen as a good way to, to get Japan's attention, brandish a nuclear threat of some kind. Uh, but it's unlikely in the next uh, decade or so that regional powers are going to have anything but the most rudimentary nuclear capability is that, 
And of course, nuclear weapons are much better for threats than if you actually have to use them. Uh, and even the threats may backfire. To threaten Japan, for example, with nuclear attack, if it uh, permits the United States base rights, would be to give Japan a huge incentive to make sure that this problem is finally solved. North Korean problems dealt with. So the nuclear threats may back. Biological weapons, it seems to me, in contrast to these other types of weapons, are likely to be seen as promising more decisive political and military effects than conventional or chemical weapons, and as less risky than nuclear weapons. Now, I wouldn't want to be caught arguing that they're not risky, these kinds of threats for these types of uses. Uh, but let's recall that an aggressor that somehow fell into a confrontation militarily with the United States is going to be in a high-risk game. And the, the point of the game is going to be uh, to uh, either break our political will or defeat us as quickly as possible before we can bring all of our military power to bear. Uh, and that's a high-risk game. And the, and the risks of using VW for that may be seen as uh, less daunting, but still probably daunting, than using <coughs> nuclear weapons for that purpose. Now, let, let me then come, to, let me go back to a little more specific discussion of how biological weapons might be used in service of each of those seven basic strategic imperatives. The first of those, you'll recall, was to deter coalition formation. Well, there it may take little more than the threat of VW use uh, to dissuade some members of a coalition from signing up. Uh, simply having a reputation to, uh, as a state that might have biological weapons might be sufficient to keep those out who don't have a real big stake. Uh, but if the threat isn't sufficient, well then how about a nice covert, illustrative attack, only covert from the point of view of the public eye, uh, but you communicate to the regime in question that you have, uh, that you DPRK Special Forces have positioned in Osaka a little influenza bomb, and that the Japanese leadership should keep an eye out for this outbreak of disease. The public's not going to get up and on. The public's not going to be enraged by this, and thus legitimize some strong Japanese or, or U.S. reaction to this. On the contrary, the regime's going to, the Japanese government will have a strong interest in not ever letting the public know that this happened. So, threats, perhaps, with non-lethal agents. Uh, to deter coalition intervention, uh, these are the second and third purposes on that list, to deter intervention even if the coalition is coming to being, or to achieve a fait accompli on the ground before the coalition can act, uh, reversible only at high cost to the coalition. Well, it, you might, an aggressor might choose to make very heavy use of biological agents. Uh, this would hold out to the American public, to CNN, etc., a vision of, and our coalition partners, a vision of mass casualties associated with such use. Uh, and uh, now, biological weapons are someti sometimes decried uh, in the United States military community as of limited utility because they're slow acting. Well, they're not all slow acting. But even in this circumstance, who cares if they're slow acting? Maybe you want them to be slow acting. You want the, the lingering deaths in uh, Riyadh to go on and on and on, to continue to have the shock value. Uh, the plague might be a suitable weapon in that case. The reason I cite uh, the use of toxins for battlefield use is toxins are the fastest acting of the biological agents. And uh, they act, in some cases, as quickly as chemical warfare agents. I mean, they are chemical. So, uh, the third imperative was to cripple the intervening force should it actually move to intervention. Uh, and for that purpose, VW attacks on ports of embarkation and debarkation, perhaps on forces en route. What better way to weaken an intervening force if you're able to attack them all as they sit in their troop carrier ship or in the airplane? Give them all some very virulent, perhaps non-lethal, version of uh, influenza, for example. The troops are incapacitated, the buildup doesn't happen, the ports are closed. Uh, imagine, if you will, uh, to 
close a, a port in South Korea, um, the use of VW agents to uh, in, in just one attack, what would the civilian truck drivers do? Well, they probably wouldn't hang around, would they? Uh, and something like 80% of the personnel that uh, move the freight through the ports in South Korea that are most likely to be used by uh, an intervening coalition force are civilians. So for those purposes, biological weapons, and again, speed of effect uh, doesn't particularly matter. Maybe you want slow effect. Uh, if your goal then falls to inflicting defeat on the intervening force, well, We've never conceived of biological weapons as useful in extended ground operations, but if the aggressor thinks that, well, I'm going to have to hold off these guys for two to three weeks for some reason, um, well, let them get sick. Let the cumulative effect of disease take its toll. Even if it does nothing in the immediate tactical battle, uh, the cumulative effect could be significant. But I think the more likely and worrisome targets for VW use in such a, uh, a scenario are on targets of campaign significance. Now this is a British term. The Brits watch Americans discuss VW and invoke the nuclear language. And we Americans tend to say, well, they're either strategic uses or tactical uses. And the Brits say, you missed the whole big middle ground, which is targets of campaign significance. These aren't cities. They're not strategic. I mean, it's just oversimplify the argument. But they're not forward edge of the battle area either. Uh, logistic centers, airfields, naval forces at sea. Naval forces at sea spend little time thinking about vulnerability. Um, imagine a Persian Gulf War scenario in which this time the aggressor knows when the war is going to start, because he's going to start it, and is able surreptitiously to de deploy BW agents against uh, a naval task force that isn't anticipating conflict. Cloud comes in, Navy currently has no detectors for BW. Uh, cloud comes in, infects the forces. Two days later, people start to get sick. Three days later, the war starts. That's an attack on an art, on a target of campaign significance. Uh, the next one, this would be a use, this would be an interesting lesson learned case. Uh, the work of the United Nations Special Commission on Iraq has revealed a great deal about the VW program that Iraq denied having in the first place. Uh, the, the punchline is that Iraq had three, at least, three weaponized biological warfare agents, one of which was aflatoxin, which has no immediate effect. It causes liver cancer one to three years after uh, use. Uh, but the other agents, anthrax and botoxin, were put into aircraft-delivered bombs, and after the uh, air campaign began uh, in Desert Storm, uh, these were taken out to the ends of two unmarked, unpaved runways in the middle of the desert and buried at the end. No command post, no guard post, no, nobody, nothing. And the, the commanders had an instruction to use this weaponry against any available target in the event the coalition forces marched Baghdad. Now, Kim, Kim Jong-il could look at this experience and say, Saddam Hussein was a smart fellow. He managed to deter the coalition from going on and doing the obvious necessary thing by making BW threats. And well, just because we don't see evidence of the threats doesn't mean that they didn't happen. Um, I, there is no evidence that a threat was communicated. There is no evidence that anyone at the senior level in the coalition understood that these weapons existed, these particular weapons, and had been deployed with those particular uh, instructions. But nonetheless, it's an interesting case that a future aggressor might look at and say, this is a good use for biological weapons. And lastly, if the regime survives the whole schmear, BW uh, could be useful for a variety of things that, again, NBC and conventional might be. But let's come back for I mean, terrorism. Uh, let's say they're motivated primarily by a desire to seek revenge on those who denied them their aggression. Well, poisoning your enemies is an old uh, form of uh, revenge warfare. Um, 
poisoning entire ethnic groups. The assumption that about the aflatoxin was that aflatoxin was a bomb designed to kill Kurds, and that it was a way to kill Kurds without anybody ever finding a smoking gun. You mean you guys are getting sick from something that happened three years ago? Son, no, we need better proof than that, right? Would say the international community. So, revenge motives. Now, there is an argument uh, recently broke into the press that uh, the Gulf War syndrome may be associated with some kind of revenge attacks of a bioengineered Iraqi agent. Munskan is very clear that. What we now know about the BW problem is probably less than 50% of what there was in the way of an Iraqi BW program. So we can only speculate about whether the Gulf War syndrome is associated with that. Now I'll move a little more quickly here through a couple of slides on the effects, the actual effects of use. Uh, politically, uh, would an aggressor have it right? Okay, an aggressor has to accomplish all of those things in war. That doesn't mean he's going to be able to do so or accomplish. Uh, threats would put very large stresses on coalitions. We would probably find defectors. We would probably find countries that didn't want to sign up in the first place that we thought would want to be there. On the other hand, threats are a very tricky business politically. Uh, and particularly when the threat is related to the annihilation of the country being threatened. We have seen Europeans stand up in unanimity and with resolve for four decades in the way that they have never shown unanimity or resolve in the face of just such a threat. So an aggressor would have to calculate uh, with the uncertainty of, well, maybe my VW threat might well back, backfire in a way that we think, I argued, a nuclear threat might backfire. Uh, and my own guess is that actual use of BW, so long as it's massively destructive, would have a politically galvanizing effect on the coalition. Uh, it's one thing, I mean, our, our colleague at Ida, George Quester, who some of you will know from the University of Maryland and a lot of work on strategic affairs, are, has put this uh, nicely. He says, you know, we, we've all come to live in neighborhoods where people have handguns. Uh, but to live with an axe murderer, that's a different proposition. You can't live with an axe murderer. And neighborhoods have to take care of their axe murderers. And a state that's in Iraq that goes from conquering Kuwait to dropping bio bombs on uh, Riyadh, Tel Aviv, Rome, Berlin, London, this is a regime no one's going to want to sue for peace, right? Uh, so, uh, whether the aggressor actually gets what he wants out of the BW problem, and whether he's actually thought the problem through far enough to get to this point, these are two big unanswered questions. The operational effects of use. Uh, unfortunately, these are likely to tally up fairly nicely from the point of view of the aggressor, which is to say that for attacks on cities and civilian populations generally, tiny quantities of agents assuming you can deliver it properly, uh, can cause huge casualties. I, don't, I won't put a debate that with you, but yeah, I was surprised when we read the Tom Clancy book in, in the bio-war scenario that he presented. Casualties are very small. The psychological effects were massive. You know, people were afraid to go outside or talk to anybody or touch anybody, but still the, the casualties are small. Is, is that unrealistic to you? or? Well, it depends on the agent. Um, the plague, a pretty efficient agent, uh, would make a lot of people deadly sick. Uh, anthrax would make a lot of people deadly sick. Bot toxin, uh, tularemia, these are things where you have to get lethal concentration, it, where it's a little more challenging to get the dosages. Uh, it depends a lot on whether it's a contagious infectious disease or, or if it's not transmitted. That's right, and, and I think a, a, an aggressor is more likely to choose the low lethality BW agents so that we're, it, it gets easy for us to retaliate if there are millions of people dying. Um, but as Clancy put his finger on, if you can choose an agent that's going to generate fewer casualties and a lot of panic, the panic is going to make it difficult to build consensus behind a concerted response. Not impossible. Um, 
Israel is probably the only country that practices civil defense in this area. And their civil defense uh, uh, is mostly a, a graft out of the uh, chemical area, or grafted onto the chemical defenses that we saw displayed so well in the Persian Gulf War. What do they do? Just, it's just face masks? Is that what it is? Or it's uh, masks. masks. Um, it's a uh, saran wrap effect of the uh, of your apartment. I mean, so so uh, basically their, their entire approach to civil defense has been to protect individual apartment buildings. <coughs> Families are supposed to go home and they're supposed to zip up. And if they go out, they're supposed to know all about masking. And if you do the masking, and our particular vestige of our strong interest in chemical warfare during the Cold War is that we think of the masking problem as being the chemical warfare mask. Uh, and that's, that's not the BW problem. BW threats, all but one, are inhalation threats. Uh, and uh, the dust filter mask that any of you who work at home in a wood shop will have is probably sufficient, assuming you can make uh, a, a closed seal for which Vaseline or rubber cement are perfectly effective. Uh, you, all of us have that picture of uh, Japanese uh, people who are sick walking around with their masks on. Well, if you can get that seal to close here, that's going to go a long way towards mitigating this problem. Uh, but the picture of America stockpiling millions of these dust masks in basements in the way that we did uh, other things for fear of strategic nuclear attack is a picture that doesn't sell today. But it just, sells in just, Israel, and it probably ought to sell in South Korea. Just to be clear, it's the little paper mask, or it's the rebreather type thing? <laughs> little paper mask. Okay. Now, you know, the, you know, in case one. it ever comes up. Yeah, 96 <laughs> cents at Walmart. There you go. The, the 3M dust from The problem with the paper mask is they get wet. I mean, they acquire the, yeah, you the vapor from your breath. Uh, and the 3M dust masks actually have a little rebreather. <coughs> Not, it's not a carbon filter, but it's a separate device. If you really want to be prepared, it's a joke. So much for the orthodox change. Now, for attacks on the targets of campaign significance, remember airfield, ports, logistics centers, naval task forces, um, active and passive defenses, assuming you have tactical warning, <coughs> big assumption, assuming you know that the agent's coming. Uh, unless you're going to sleep and operate in these masks, which might, which might be perfectly, perfectly sufficient if you're going through an extended 24-48 hour period of uh, warning, uh, and revised operational practices. And that's a big and. Uh, uh, there are a lot of things you want to do differently in a regional war in which you think the aggressor might have NBC weapons. Disperse, uh, more emphasis on mobility, uh, that's a, another topic I suppose. But, if you do all of that, you can minimize the effects. You will not eliminate them. Uh, and, of course, if the intended target uh, includes unprotected civilians, as many of the targets of campaign significance would, the effect could be devastating. And, uh, that point I think is, follows logically many others. Now, this, uh, this may, let me just say, this may be, since we don't know what aggressors actually think about biological weapons, there was a conference recently on CONOPS for biological in Washington at SAIC, and the punchline was, it's not a secret, it's a mystery to them. I mean, we, there's no evidence that most of the states that have biological weapons have thought very much about what they would do with them. Uh, the Iraqis did not have uh, a detailed strategic operational concept of how these weapons would be used. And maybe I've just written one for them, in which case I would appreciate you not circulating it to them. Or, and maybe we do an injustice by assuming that there's that much sophistication in their thinking. But yet I think it's incumbent upon us to think the problem well, through. In this with, all the, uh, with all the uh, material laid through the uh, Iranians, uh, chemicals. There's no evidence, to my knowledge, certainly not on the public side, that there was anything biological. They had, uh, according to UNSCOM, they had an initial interest in bio back in 75, 76, began to think of it as a potential strategic counterweight. And they, 
they being one very ambitious scientist who came forward to the command council and got Saddam Hussein's interest in this. Not a, not a, a wholesale leadership effort. The program kind of trickled along for probably 10 years. Uh, and even through the Iran-Iraq war, it never, it does, there's no evidence so far uncovered that suggests that it was kicked into a higher gear. Uh, but everything that was created, the production lines, the delivery systems, the, uh, the limited stockpile of weaponry and agent that they had, came from about three years, the, the decision to, to produce it about three years before the invasion of Kuwait. So although there was a long lead time, it was essentially a bunch of scientists and technical people off doing some things on the side uh, and only integrated very late. Now to turn, I have uh, three more slides. Um, this one focuses on the defense preparedness agenda, uh, where we have in our society a, a strong tendency to look for silver bullets. What's the one thing that's going to work here? Is it going to be the mask? Is it going to be vaccines? Well, either office offers a lot of problems a lot of promise for dealing with certain of those contingencies. But none is going to solve the problem across the board. Vaccines, for example. Uh, vaccines can be overwhelmed. Uh, vaccines are designed to prepare us for a certain dosage exposure. But if the dosage exposure is 10 times that, vaccines are not going to do anything. Vaccines are also designed to deal with, uh, uh, currently, there is no such thing as a broad spectrum vaccine. There are probably six or seven different kinds of anthrax. We can inoculate for one, or six, but, but separately. And an aggressor who knows that you've done one through six is gonna find seven, or I'm just, just gonna pour the anthrax down the, the drain and go to bot toxin. So vaccine will be irrelevant. So vaccination, uh, some of you I think saw the some of the UNSCOM reports on what Iraq might have been able to do with anthrax and what it would have been able to do if our forces had been inoculated. I mean, it knocks the problem down from scores of thousands of casualties to small hundreds. The vaccines can have a big effect, but they can't solve the problem. Masking, the same arguments apply. Uh, and I've already noted that we have a certain way of thinking about the BW individual and collective protection problem that comes out of our chemical experience, and this is probably to our detriment. Uh, reliable detectors, this became a high priority after the Persian Gulf War. There's a joint US, Canadian, British detector development program. It's a 14 year timeline. Now, I mean, there will be detectors fielded earlier. The ones at the end of the 14 years are going to look pretty fancy. They use LIDAR-based technologies to scan for clouds across the horizon, give you a lot more warning. But that problem is a long way from being cracked. Uh, Counterforce. Of course, uh, uh, Counterforce was not able to contribute much to our dealing with the Iraqi BW threat. We didn't have the intelligence to know where to target, and we were very fearful of the collateral effects actually conducting the effects. And again, this is a technology development problem. There are some uh, BW related uh, weapon systems under development to target with minimal collateral effects, but that problem also has a way from being solved. And there is, there is a particularly uh, common reaction to this description of biological weapons. When you come to the sort of core argument there that biologic weapons could be the weapon of choice for an aggressor, there's good reason to think that these are going to look a lot better for his purposes than chemical, conventional, or nuclear weapons. If that's the case, if this is the weapon of choice, and if it's really as easy as all of us say, and if there are really that many countries that are involved in, in doing it, well, then this is a, a very hard problem, but we have nuclear weapons, and that's good enough, thank you. Um, we paint ourselves in a terrible corner by betting on nuclear deterrence. That is the attitude of the services currently. Bet on nuclear deterrence. We don't need to invest in vaccines. We don't need to do the masking work. The, the uh, detector development can go on the slow track. Uh, and nuclear threats will work. Well, if you line up again to go back to that category of seven imperatives, 
we're going to offer nuclear threats in response to their in, to a covert, illustrative, non-lethal attack on Jamal. Why is it covert if you've already gotten us into a aggressive situation? So well, I'm bothered with this entire talk you've discussed. Is this, it's all in the open, and now you're telling us it's covert. If it's covert, we don't know who's attacking us anyway. Well, well moreover, if it's co covert, well, everything you're talking about is coalition and aggression, etc., and not well, uh, anything about covertness. And if I you know that, and 100,000 people have just died in Chicago, and you know Iraq is underway, uh, I don't see why you wouldn't use nukes or some other major, massive deterrent or, or punishment. Agree. I agree with that. I wouldn't want to be caught arguing otherwise. Okay. I agree with that, but I was re referring to a particular one of these strategic imperatives, which is in the very early game, you want to deter, it's when George Bush is just getting on the phone for the first time, and you, and per, let's take a Korean contingency here. Uh, well, that's a bad one for coalition formation, but here, um, your goal if you're the aggressor is to is to isolate the United States. It's gonna. You want it to be. Only, you, you either want the United States out altogether, or you want to only deal with the United States. The United States knows who wants them out. Right. Okay. So it's clear. Right. But if you use. It's fair. Right. Okay. But you can use BW agents covertly, communicating to leaders in Washington and Tokyo or wherever that you're responsible for this outbreak of infectious diseases somewhere, but you're not going to tell the public. To tell the public would be to enrage the public, and the public would demand exactly what you said. Why well, wouldn't we enrage our own public? Why should we? But what if take people that? are only getting sick? I mean, I agree with your scenario. If it's tens of thousands of people in Chicago, I don't understand why. If it's a thousand people, Baghdad is sacrosanct. If they're the cause of a hundred thousand people just died in Chicago, That's I'm agreeing with you. Okay. I'm not What's saying Baghdad would. Be. I'm not certain. Uh, I'm still at a loss. But the, the asymmetry can go on both sides. I mean, the ACMG works both ways. Yes. It's, the the B, it's the BW shot across the bow. Well, can, can you elaborate? I, I realize well, we're getting, I'm we're getting classified here, but can you elaborate on deniability? And how, deni how deniable are these kind of attacks? Do, do we have the capability to know what's going on, really? Well, they're tremendously. And one of the scenarios that concerns people in the, the Persian Gulf is that if there if there is a use of a bio agent that's clear, that's not covert, it may also not have been conducted by the party with which we're, we're at war. Yeah. Uh, they're they're eminently deniable. Yeah. Uh, that's it makes because sense. They it makes sense for Iran to do something to get us to pound Iraq, right? Now, if it's a missile delivered, <laughs> then you know, we can track that. If it's used in the theater, <laughs> we can track that. Mm -hmm. But if it's a state-sponsored use that may occur days before we actually detect it, then it's, then it's very denial. But I, I want to make sure that I've addressed your concern, because I agree with the calculus that says if, if an aggressor kills tens of thousands of people in Chicago, the American response is very clear, and it doesn't matter how he did it. If, though, all the aggressor has done is make 25 people sick in Osaka, and told people in, Japan, in Tokyo and Washington that if they don't knuckle under, there are 15 of these bombs with lethal agents in them going off in a week's time. The pressure to appease and get out is going to be intense. That's my point. Yes, if the aggressor makes it easy for us by doing the stupid thing, which aggressors typically do, it'll work the way you I think that'd be extremely successful in non-governmental actors. That's what was good, yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and it's not, I, I think our ability to apply economic, military, you name it, pressure on an organized government who tries to, you want know, to say, blackmail us into something, uh, in today's environment, uh, it would be foolhardy for anybody to do that. And, and I think the threat there really has to be the non-governmental guys who, number one, we don't know where they live, we don't know where they train, we only suspect those are the guys we've got to worry about. They have no political uh, orientation. That's right. And uh, that, that's that's the big problem. Well, I, let, let, I, I could let, see a change in operational practice, though. For example, if you read Schwarzkopf's book, um, I mean, they were talking about the left hook as the chemical killing sack <laughs> that some of the American commanders, uh, this was their worst nightmare. That, somehow Saddam wasn't 
uh, wasn't just leaving this blank uncovered. If there, he, he did it for a purpose. And conceivably, if there was some sort of demonstration, it might have even changed the amount of strategy somewhat. And it's conceivable to me that you could play tricks with the sink's mind. I, I would think you're right, but I, I think he hit on a real key point. And, and I call it the Pearl Harbor effect. It would galvanize the American public to such an extent that, you know, if you want to say we're going to use massive response, whether that's nuclear or whatever, uh, you know, conventional, it, it doesn't matter. I think that the, the Pearl Harbor effect, when somebody uses one of those in mass against standing forces, um, I, I just don't think it'd be tolerated. I think it would it would galvanize. But what if two thirds of the troops come down with the flu, though? I mean, that's that's a difference. Yeah, you've established your conditions. Conditions you said against standing forces with massively destructive effect, okay. and that's an important range of scenarios for us to fit into this picture. But there could be other uses that fit neither of those conditions that could still fit in the aggressor's picture of how to use fire. And and then then we're left with we wanted that on nuclear deterrence. We and if we're enraged, we might. But the restrictions on using nuclear weapons in reply are substantial, political and legal. We might, we might find in a war such as this that those restrictions are stripped off of us by everyone around us saying, you've got to. I, this is my, I mean, I think we have entirely the wrong picture of coalition politics in a future war like this. Mm -hmm. where, the, where our picture is we're going to have these reluctant allies that we need to chase around like cats that are <laughs> off wandering in different directions, and we're, we're going to be the resourceful, strong power, when it may be precisely the opposite. They are the ones who either cannot live with the BW attacks being, being made upon them, or can't survive politically in a region where the, the threatener is left there to continue to work his ways. We don't want to use our nuclear weapons, and Presumably because we're operating at the end of a long logistic chain through relatively few number of ports and airfields without probably a lot of coalition partners, we're not going to have the means to escalate conventionally. Or where the only escalation option conventionally is to seek removal of the regime, which then gives the regime no incentive to be restrained. The regime then has nothing to lose, so all bets are off. Go to your highest leverage option. So our conventional escalatory response to BWs doesn't look very attractive in many scenarios, and our nuclear response doesn't look very attractive. It's a devilishly difficult problem. If he makes it easy by killing hundreds of thousands of people, that's easy. Let me, let me, let me push this particular one. Uh, I mean, as you were describing the, uh, the uh, coalition thing, um, I was thinking of the French at the end of the Second World War. I mean, they wanted, they wanted their share of occupied Germany. They gave the occupying authorities fits for years about reintegrating the western part of Germany. They wouldn't cooperate. They looted. They, I mean, they were, they, their role in the, in the coalition was, was revenge. Okay. And that's entirely all right. But at the same time, when we have Germany collapsing, I mean, if you look at the, pic, at the newsreel pictures, uh, the German soldier to the last day of the war was carrying his gas mask around in that tin can. Our, our soldiers had long ago thrown their gas mask out and were keeping chocolate bars and cigarettes. And, I mean, and the Germans didn't use gas. I mean, they were collapsing. The Russians are coming, stealing toilets, raping women. They didn't use gas. So the, so the evidence that the, the failing state will go to this is not really borne out on the basis of any historical evidence. I mean, why, I think why that's do we, far too sweeping. Why, 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 I mean, if, if someone like if someone like the Hitler regime, you know, would not use it, and they were, I mean, because they hadn't used all the gas in Auschwitz. I mean, they had military well, the gas there. The counterpoint, George, is if, if Syria or Iran, for example, thought they had an interest in using this, they would probably have Hamas do it instead of taking responsibility. Right. So just because you can't nail Iran doesn't mean they're not responsible. But okay. you can't target Hamas, they don't have territory. But so I think it, if we it doesn't invalidate the possibility. If we were in a war with Syria and, and Hamas did use it, we'd still retaliate against Syria, I believe. Well, uh, that may be not but, the best example, but there are NGOs out there 
that we couldn't identify with right. the state that may have common interest with the state. Oh, I think there's a, that's a, a whole separate issue that, I mean, we'll, we'll get to after you finish your slides, is that all of this is state-focused. Yeah. I mean, that's why I'm saying a collapsing state may not, because the Nazis didn't, the Japanese didn't. They did. And, well, yes. And, I take your point. And we'll but NGOs and other things very well may, and that's a kind of separate category. That's a separate. All right. It's an overlapping category. And, uh, and but, but, but supporting what you're saying is that we, the, the military, is, is fixated on state-to-state -state behavior. I mean, if we could become convinced, like through the argument I just made, that no other army would do this, therefore we're safe, uh, you could make a convincing argument that no other organized army would do this. But I don't think, I mean, because the Iraqis did. But I don't think you could make that argument for the NGOs, the third parties, the... Well, we can come to this, the uh, non-state actor in the CBW. I mean, that's the topic of the other book, Making the Rounds. Right. Here. And, and there are some, I think, some useful things to be said on that right now. But, but I, I just want to make a point on, in response to this. Didn't no one else? I, I, I typically make the argument you make. I, I think the conventional wisdom about you back an aggressor into the corner and he's going to lash out may be wrong. The point is, historical experience is only illustrative and very limited on this particular score. And we tend to infer conclusions about future behavior on a base of experience. It's very narrow. And frankly, I think Saddam Hussein probably studied that experience. And this is a part of the reason you have the Republican Guard. Professional militaries have an interest in living to fight another day. And it's not just a self-interest. It's their national picture. We're here, to, we're here to protect the nation. Now we're going to go wage a war of national suicide? Uh, so then you create a cadre that uh, that has a particular allegiance to the regime, and that the cadre, the particular Nazi cadre, couldn't act in the way it might have in this thinking, has a lot to do with the particular way in which that war ended and the regime collapsed. Mm -hmm. So I'm not. Uh, I mean, I think it's absolutely the case that we should we should uh, we should be able. Uh, these weapons are not a gilt-edged guarantee of the sovereignty of these nations. We, we should not expect that they're going to be able to use them to make these, these uh, t tremendously dissuasive th threats as last resort weapons in wars like this. But nor can we write off the possibility that there will be cadres within the regime that are going to be willing to do so, or at least try to do so. I, guess I have two more slides. Well, I, I, guess, <laughs> no, I guess based on your, your comment that the, uh, the nuclear a nuclear retaliation will dissuade a state. What dissuaded any of the European powers between 39 and 44, or Japan between what, 38 and, and 45, from using theirs when there were no nukes? Right. Um, nor, nor were there, but there weren't a big, it didn't appear to have big biological retaliatory capabilities either. Right. Well, that's a good question. And uh, the rule of thumb is that World War II proves that deterrence in kind works. And that's a rule of thumb that has been picked apart usefully uh, by a number of people. And I commend you particularly an article by a military historian that was in international security in 1983, John Moon, uh, who looked at the experience of chemical weapons in World War II. And his basic argument was, it's, it's, an, it's an argument that we should bear in mind as we try to understand Iraq. Well. Different things explain at different times why different actors didn't do things. Sometimes everybody was deterred by just no one wanted to unleash this new level of war. Some of the leaders, including Hitler, were very concerned about what this would do to his public standing in his own country. Uh, Roosevelt was concerned about what this would do to the, his competition with Churchill in, in, in the United Nations. Um, Hitler's own personal gassing in World War I had something to do with this. Uh, yeah, he ordered the destruction of the infrastructure of the Third Reich, at least according to uh, right. And we the fire architect bombed uh, Spear. Spear. Spear claims he stopped it. It was a well, big peak. And we firebombed uh, and killed yeah. many and more we people than our chemicals. destroy weapons. their own. So, I mean, this is, the, I, I mean, I think 
the answer is we as social scientists tend to look for the single answer to your question. When in fact history is usually explained by a lot of different factors coalescing in some particular way. Well, you, you started out saying you were looking at asymmetric situations, and World War II was a very symmetric situation. So I mean, the, the analogies aren't that close. Okay. Yeah. Two more slides, and then we can take the conversation wherever you would like. I'd just like to lay these last ideas on, on the table. And if you take that picture that I have, of, there is no so, silver bullet from the point of view of defense planning for the BW problem. Well, there's no silver bullet overall for the BW problem. Uh, how, do, how do we bring military preparations into balance with everything else that the nation might want to do to limit the BW problem? Um, it must be an integrated strategy that fits these pieces together. Uh, closing, I think this is a classic window of vulnerability. Aggressors are perceiving options here, and for that I think there is good evidence, uh, perhaps not in detail that I have laid out, but they're perceiving options and we're perceiving a problem that, gee, we ought to get up to speed on. Well, we, should, we had a wake-up call in Iraq five years later. There's no tangible difference to the disposition of our forces. Zero. Um, but this is a problem that's not amenable to military solutions alone. Let me just put it this way. Uh, the U.S. military, I think, would find it virtually impossible to, to project force in a world in which re major regions were dominated by powers with large biological arsenals matched to long-range delivery systems. That would be a different kind of world. Uh, export controls have an important role to play. There are a lot of people in the Washington policy community that say this is the main thing we ought to do. Um, but they can't cut off trade completely in this area. And arms control, uh, equally imperfect. There are certainly no arms control silver bullets in this area. The Biological Weapons Convention obviously didn't eliminate the problem of biological weapons. Did it somehow contribute to their non-proliferation during this period? I would argue probably yes. The Chemical Weapons Convention hangs in the balance today. You probably have seen Jesse Helms dueling with the, the administration on this. The convention enters into force April 29th. The United States may or may not be a party. Uh, if it is uh, not a party, there are some political and economic consequences that are dangerous, I think. The political one, from the point of view of this problem, what, from the point of view of the military management of the problem, what does the CWC contribute? Two things. One, it limits the number of countries in the BW business and it, in the CW business, and it keeps their arsenals small and unsophisticated. These are definitely in our national interest, in our military interest. That's a much more manageable problem. Secondly, it provides the political context to go out and do the hard work that you have to do sometimes. When the United States, when the Reagan administration wanted to bomb the Libyan chemical warfare plant, nobody signed up with us in that endeavor. Because at the time the United States was producing binary weapons right at the street here, we were a possessor of the largest stockpile, or one of the two largest stockpiles of chemical weapons, and this looked a little morally troubling. Here we were going to go out and police uh, a bad guy state while we were doing what the bad guy state was. The CWC helps to solve that problem. It provides a normative context. I don't want to oversell the chemical convention, but I think Jesse Holmes is wrong to think that we can do without it. So, uh, no silver bullets. And the final slide. Uh, and these are just closing thoughts that you will have already heard. Uh, but what are the barriers to doing what we need to do in this area? So far, the Defense Counterproliferation Initiative has been about developing technology. It's been about uh, detectors, principally, secondarily about vaccines in the BW area. It's also been about some different things in the nuclear, chemical, and missile areas. But particularly on bio, it's been a technology development on this 14-year timeline. Well, even if that goes right, that's only the tip of the iceberg. What you do if you live in a world in which aggressors have biological weapons. Uh, you have to change your operational concepts. Your doctrine has to differ, probably. Training, uh, coalition, uh, coalition preparations. All of this, I mean, when we talk about facing North Korea or Iraq, <coughs> there's got to be a lot of other countries that have gone through some of this with us. Not least an understanding of 
the questions that were so troubling to us. What happens? How do we escalate? And in a coalition, there are going to be a lot. There are going to be a lot of countries wanting to participate in that discussion. And it's going to be in our real strong interest to have them participate and share the responsibility for any outcomes that are bad. Second reason, second barrier, this is still too hard. Uh, it's unfamiliar, and when something is unfamiliar, what do we all do? We look for analogies. And particularly in the bio area, people look at the nuclear domain. Strategic tactical, I already referred to. Um, perhaps I need to elaborate that point, given the time is short. But it remains too hard. And if it remains too hard, there's a great allure of false remedies. Uh, it's very common for the Navy to say, look, we're a mobile force. We can, uh, we can navigate right around those VW attacks. And moreover, we have a washdown ability. We're always washing our ships down anyway. Well, that's fine. If you know that there's a threat coming, if you can seal up the ship, close down your air conditioning, manage to fight with the air conditioning off while you're decontaminating, there is the allure of uh, chemical preparedness, which is only in some ways appropriate for this particular challenge. And there is the belief that you can bet on nuclear escalation. And lastly, and this, this brings us to one of the points of discussion, uh, the Persian Gulf War looms very large in thinking about the VW problem. Uh, and it troubles me here. Iraq has been so skillful in the UNSCOM process at telling us exactly what we wanted to hear what it thought we already knew or what it thought we were about to find out. Now they have come when we had the great revelations as a result of the defector who then went back and got shot, uh, which, which there ought to raise something. Um, but uh, one of the revelations was uh, he was asked, well, why? You had all this stuff. Why didn't you use it? Oh, well, your threats, you know, we remembered Baker's letter. Well, why? You know, if maybe that's true. But remember, Baker's letter included, it specified four actions, any one of which would induce the big threat, nebulously stated. But only one of them was using NBC weapons, setting the oil fields ablaze, terrorist actions, and I forget the fourth. But this should raise a question about whether our deterrent threat worked as they would have us believe. Why do they want us to believe that, that it worked? Perhaps it's to lull us into thinking that We've already got our remedy to this problem and don't need to take the VW threat seriously. Uh, and this is a place that a lot of people come out on the problem in Washington. Okay, the VW threat's bad. There's some band-aids we can put on it. Fundamentally, it's going to be a nuclear uh, dominated scenario in which even if we don't use our nuclear weapons, the threats will be sufficient to manipulate the choices made by the aggressor. And that is very convenient for us, and we should ward against I know our time is short. I might just lay three ideas on the table to, to arising out of the terrorism book that made the rounds. Um, what, if you think about this problem from the point of view of the non-state actor, what the book did, uh, we had uh, commissioned some papers and, and uh, convened a study group and uh, issued this report to look at three basic questions. Was 1995 a watershed year? was, uh, are the political and uh, technical constraints on the use of CV weapons going away? And was, uh, has the taboo been broken on CV use? These are the three arguments that were typically heard in the media and in the policy community after the Aum Shinrikyo attack. And, and from my point of view, this, this was the chicken little school. The sky is falling, my god, the taboo has been broken, the restraints are gone, and all terrorists are mimics, so the taboo has been broken, everybody can do it. Well, we found out some interesting things along the way. Uh, 1995, uh, there are in fact more than 200 instance, instances in which chemical or biological agents have been used for illegal acts in the last two decades. Uh, let us recall um, Tylenol poisoning. You recall the, uh, the Rajneesh cult? in Oregon that uh, tried to throw a local election. There was a local election, a 
instance, where some of the candidates wanted to throw the cold out. And so they went around and sprayed all the salad bars with salmonella poison and put some portion of the local population in the hospital. They didn't go vote. Well, they still lost. Cult got jailed. Uh, this is the reason we have sneeze bars on our salad bars, or sneeze guards. Um, but this picture that somehow, well, we, we discovered that useful point of reference. We discovered that there was another major act of chemical terrorism attempted in the United States. Uh, the World Trade Center tower bombing. Uh, the bomb itself included a uh, uh, vessel of cyanide, the purpose of which was to be distributed by the heat blast through the building and to kill any people that hadn't been killed in the direct blast itself, and moreover to kill the emergency responders that came. Well, it didn't work. And this was suppressed, uh, but it came out in the sentencing statement of the judge. Um, we also well, recognizing the time is short. The second question are the constraints going away. Well, we looked at the two sets of constraints, political and technical. Uh, the political <coughs> argument we had, uh, Brian Jenkins, any of you who have worked in the terrorism studies field will recognize that name. He's thought long and hard about these issues. Brian's argument is the terrorists use violence like a volume control knob. You want to turn it up loud enough so that you get attention to your cause, but if you turn it up too loud, you're going to pay a big price. You may delegitimize yourself with your constituency. You may invoke an overreaction from the state. For that kind of terrorist, there's no reason to think that weapons of mass destruction are any more appealing post on than pre on Technical constraints. Uh, you know, everybody makes so easy. Anybody can make these infectious agents. Lots of evidence that the militia movement in America, in particular, is interested in bio agents. And it, it's true that it's easy to make bio-warfare agents. It's harder to deliver them. It's harder to bring together a successful terrorist attack. Uh, a successful terrorist bio-attack requires not just the scientific ability to make agents, but the technical ability to know how to disperse it. And that means you have to know something about the air exchange rates and the air conditioning system. Uh, and it requires the sort of criminal ability to accumulate all the stuff to do it. And it requires the operational sense to know how to scope the whole thing out, lay the plan out, test the plan, do the plan, get out safely, assuming that's, that's a priority. So technical constraints aren't large, but they're not trivial. They are declining. They haven't gone away. Uh, and lastly, on uh, has the taboo been broken? Well, basically, we looked in a little more detail at uh, Brian Jenkins' argument. And it's certainly the case that for the terrorist groups that we've known in the 60s, 70s, and 80s that were politically motivated, that sought to get a concession from the state somehow, a seat at the table for the PLO, a bit of territory for the IRA, uh, uh, whatever, uh, a political concession, that for these types of terrorist organizations, weapons of mass destruction offer too much violence. But of course, these have never comprised the entirety of terrorist actors. And it's this other basket of terrorist actors that are not motivated by political purposes or by the desire to extract concessions, but by something else that we have to worry about today, and, and particularly as regards CB weapons. Uh, and these are state; these are actors that will calculate thresholds of pain and tolerance in society, just as the other ones do, but seek to cross them instead of to walk up to them and extract your concession without crossing them. And to cross this threshold, whether it's a revenge attack, a sacred terror attack, the term of art from the terrorism study world, a state-sponsored use of CV in uh, wartime circumstances also fits into that model. So uh, I, our goal was to uh, find a middle point between the hysteria that gripped uh, Washington post Aum and the complacency common before on, on this particular problem. And I think we did find the middle ground. Um, if there was a prediction that arose from all of that work, it was probably Brian Jenkins. And his prediction was that, uh, well, it, it seems likely that there will be more CB terrorist incidents in the future. 
uh, it seems m likely that there will be far more threats than actual use of CB agents. Uh, where used, C seems more likely to be. Uh, where either is used, low casualty attacks seem much more likely than high casualty attacks. Because the organizations that are going to be capable of putting together not just the technical, but also the criminal and organizational, operational expertise are those who are going to be state-sponsored, and state sponsors are not going to see this as useful except in wartime circumstances. And then we have an ability to apply leverage on the state. So that's uh, in three and a half minutes the punchline of that uh, attempt to look at the non-state actor problem in CD. Can I come back to your state actor problem with the earlier issue? And that one of the things that we talk about a lot in, in, in the strategy right now is this issue of fighting the two NRCs. And if you're fighting in that kind of a situation where you have a conflict in two places, or a conflict in one place and a real disagreement in another place, and you have a non-attributable biological attack against your country, who do you use the nuclear deterrent against? How do you make those kind of decisions? Well, you use the nuclear You offer deterrent threats to, to, to any and all. I mean, if we're in a... But, I mean, I, I don't think it's the, it's a, I think the difficulty does not arise at the level of what we say, but what we do. I understand that, but in, in, you know, in a future world where we're looking, where the United States is, is in essence the single superpower, the assumption is that we be in conflict of one kind or another with a variety of different actors, many of whom will have that kind of, of capabilities, or at least the potential of those kind of capabilities, because it's very hard to attribute that kind of an attack how do you choose to crank up your level of deterrence or who you choose to hit? I, I mean, it's, in a sense, I'm, I'm trying to come back to your point of, of the inability of using nuclear deterrence in that, in that case. But in all your description and all sort of the scenarios we've laid out, we've been laying out a one-to-one -one aggression. And, or, if, or if there's a group of, of states on one side, it's on our side and not on the other side. Um, but our strategies that we talk about at a conventional level play out the idea that we're going to be in possible conflict with more than one. Uh, and that seems to complicate what you're saying quite a bit. Um, it does. Well, but maybe, uh, well, first of all, I think that that is a, uh, we have to be careful to, as we spin our scenarios, to, um, We're all in a business where we all look for the one scenario to disprove the argument that's, uh, that's been made. And that's how we test each other's thinking. Uh, and my own guess would be that we're relatively unlikely to find ourselves in two regional wars that are both escalating to this level. Uh, that if we do, we're unlikely to be in a situation where we don't know who perpetrated the attack. If we're in that situation, though, our first inclination will be to interpret the attack in ways that are convenient for us to interpret. Uh, and I think that what we would communicate at the time would be, um, these things are going to push us against the wall. We're strapped. You're, you're, you're making our most violent response to these, these aggressions um, much easier for us because we're so strapped. I think that would sort of be the tenor of, of the diplomacy that we would be sending behind the scenes and through our allies and coalition partners. Along the way, I think we would issue a public statement that said uh, that as soon as, as soon as we can attribute this act to a particular party, we're going to seek retribution. Uh, but along the way, we're going to make sure that we do everything we can to minimize our vulnerability to further use. So if we haven't already done a lot of counterforce, I think we would leap into a lot of counterforce at that point. I agree, it's not a very satisfactory answer to the problem. Uh, but this is a very, but you're right to say that this is a very difficult uh, well, situation. Well, it makes black men on active war. It's not a you said it earlier. So even if somebody has to disarm or dis disband the nuclear, 
either the new hidden nukes or the hidden VW stuff or CW stuff. Eventually that's going to be done. We're already at war with the country of black men, so the retaliation will follow that, I guess. But I think your argument is we might not be at war with, we might be on the brink of war with another party. Well, yeah, I mean, the scenario that's talked about most usually when they talk about the two MRCs is North Korea and Iraq together. Well, they both have bio capabilities. Yeah. Um, they might not tell us they're going to do it. Suddenly, 100,000 people die in Chicago. Who do you knew? Well, <laughs> wait, 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 wait a minute. I definitely like the, chance, the possibility that in this scenario that China might find us in their interest to yeah, have yeah, us overreact. Well. <laughs> but what that, what that needs, what that kind of alludes to is uh, an emphasis not only on this on the bio aspect, but also on the intelligence aspect. And when you talk about coalition, coalition building, you're not talking just about forces, you're talking about intelligence also. And that's one thing I think that this country has been rather uh, uh, remiss in terms of wanting to share intel with other allies because they're afraid that, you know, if they find out how we know things, that they're going to know that we know things that we, are, we might be turning it on them and not blah, blah, blah. But what I'm saying is that in, some, in the case of the non-governmental actors, I'm willing to bet that that's not much, I guess, but that somebody somewhere will know something about it. Well, and if we have the feelers out, the net out, we might pick up something from Israel, we might pick up something from, I don't care, sub in Africa or something. If we've got allies that have good intelligence and they're willing to share it with us, we could probably find out and attribute. And frankly, we might fabricate some of it. I mean, to, to make the choice, to make the interpretation that suits us. Now you get into info warfare, yeah. But it's, but it's a reason. We also have a professor at MIT who's saying that it's a natural occurrence or something like that, right. too. So I mean, it's the, the, this, this may, the answer to this question would undoubtedly wander into very classified territory, that, I mean, logically. But, I mean, it's the Uncle Fester problem that you referred to in this particular case that's so interesting. That is, the, the technology, the, the know-how is so widespread. Uh, the wherewithal required does not really require state sponsorship. I mean, the first, the first discussion of this, uh, if you will, was, I mean, before Frank Herbert became famous for writing Dune, uh, he wrote that story called The White Plague, where the IRA had set off a bomb while he was a visiting professor in Ulster and it killed his wife. So he decides to get bio a, a, a biological warfare revenge on the Irish, uh, and this thing gets out of hand. I mean, are we keeping track of uh, every every uh, microbiology assistant professor that doesn't get tenure? Uh, do we? I mean, we have thousands of foreign students in this country, most of whom are in the biological sciences and the other hard sciences. And go back. Are we keeping databases on on you know Muhammad Rashid when he goes home from MIT to see where he gets a job? You're if we're, no, I'm not asking well, the question. Really not. We're not, or sh or or are we? Yeah, I mean, I mean, if we're not, the CIA should be. No, George, we, we, we are calling on a database, but but we know it's happening because we can see recruitment. We can see where recruitment is taking place, and we know. And this this is again, this is open source stuff. We know that they recruit that terrorist groups recruit from medical uh, faculties. We know they recruit from computer science faculties. We know they recruit at technological levels, and that those are prime recruitment areas. So we should be assuming that the bad guys are, in fact, attempting to develop the capabilities we've been talking about. Yes. Yeah, Further, a, furthermore, uh, there's a disturbing chapter in that uh, terrorism book by James Adams, who's the Washington-based correspondent of the Sunday Times of London, uh, who details there uh, a story that he has about uh, a Russian organization that has gone around and hired the old uh, weapons crowds from a variety of different uh, tracks and offer services. And uh, I mean, the, 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 I, I think we do a disservice to the bio problem by saying it's, ju it's just the problem of producing the infectious agents. Mm -hmm. That's not tricky. But there, there is a big learning curve associated with how you actually reap military benefits and political benefits, how you weaponize the agent, deliver the agent, what are the reliable modes of weaponization and delivery, and how much do you need of That's what your rational what? state actor, then. 
we're, I'm, we're, we're worried about the, 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 the revenge the plan. The Tokyo had two failed attempts at, uh, at using the BW in downtown Tokyo, so I mean, the, the distribution of it is really... Yeah, all the examples that, that you gave were local uh, transport. There wasn't any long transport to deliver those things. Like, so well, it's just, difficult to deliver that. And I, and I, I think that really? in order to decide whether the biological is on your barometer or not, take a look. In the cooperative threat reduction, we put what one point five billion dollars into those activities. Mm -hmm. the, the capability of destruction, if you go down, the weapons are biological, nuclear, chemical. In terms of casualties, in terms of destructive, you know, tearing up dirt and stuff like that, it's, it's nuclear followed by chemical and biological. And if you look at the store stockpiles that are out there, it's it's nuclear, chemical, biological. And yet, out of that one point five billion dollars. How much would we put against against chemical and biological? Less than five percent. And it's we've kind been discussing. Separate out the bio. Yeah, and that's what we've been discussing for four years now. And if we, if we haven't changed the barometer in that, I have a feeling that that maybe there isn't the big problem we all think there is. Well, it's a threat perception problem. Everybody knows the one thing that can actually destroy the United States and the society is nuclear yeah. and and uh, when that threat is reduced then I think you're right a refocusing probably needs to happen but you know they are not going to be able to launch on us uh, even with their tremendous chemical uh, uh, program enough that would cause us to lose it as a society the nuclear would when the nuclear gets to manageable levels you're right. I think there needs to be a refocus on the chemical and biological. But I mean, you got to categorize the threat. Right? And this, I is, think this is uh, valid and wrong. I mean, Good. I mean it's, it's, it's valid in that it, it, it's it's uh, that is the one capability that's out there that could annihilate the United States. But it is not the capability that we're likely to confront in any of the uses of American military force in the next two decades, I would argue. And that the kind of VW capability that's out there today, existing, that Iraq had, I mean, Iraq six years ago, is sufficient to accomplish virtually every one of those purposes on my list of seven. Mm -hmm. and, and why I worry about the post-Soviet crowd running around, yeah, we, we do have to be concerned about the non-state actor. I, I'm worried about the state actor. And I'll worry more about the non-state actor when we've solved the state actor problem. We have not only not solved the state actor problem, we've only barely begun to define yeah. the problem. Mm -hmm. And the state actor problem is one where there is this learning curve. And what worries me about the collapse of the Soviet Union and the revelations about Iraq is that the countries that have had the agent lying around for a long time because they could, now are climbing up the learning curve. And we're, we could quickly find ourselves in a regional war where an aggressor tries to do all of those things and is astute enough about how to not walk us up to the nuclear threshold that we're left with terrible, terrible choices. And I think this is it, it's, it's, so it's valid that we have to deal with the extant Soviet nuclear threat. The nuclear issue is a big deal, but the bio issue is a big deal too. And uh, in the CTR program, I don't think there's a lot of money. I mean, there's not much that we can do. But there are an awful lot of other things that we can be doing that we're not. Because we're still defining the problem when the aggressors are, are 10, 15, 20 years down the way. Is there any thought, or have you given any thought to, uh, should we be redefining national interests in light of this biological threat? For uh, example, should we be placing more emphasis, say, on the militia movement, given the fact that it's colored to the biological threat? Well, I definitely think the militia movement, I, I, two issues come to mind here. One is the militia movement. Uh, an uh, interesting vignette about how we know that the militia movement is interested in these things. Uh, three men found themselves dead from rice and poison 
over a course of about two years, probably two years ago. And when the police went to investigate, they found that their wives had found these uh, the Uncle Fester cookbooks. And uh, in each case, the dead husbands were militia members. And this was the first big tip-off to the FBI that not just in an isolated incident, but if you went to the militia events, this was on sale and it was the poisoning. It wasn't chemical weapons, it was the poisoning that was the uh, biological infectious materials. So uh, I do think the militia movement deserves much more prominence on our screen. Now, for the, for the, where is the national interest in this? We've always had a national interest in preventing terrorism. We've never seen ourselves particularly likely targets or particularly good targets. <coughs> terrorists were hard, were hard to attack on opponents without, and get away with it. The, 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 there is a clear issue of military policy when it comes to dealing with the problem of domestic terrorism, and that's the long prohibition against the interference of the American military in civil affairs of the United States. And this is a real issue. Uh, I was at a conference on NBC terrorism in Washington in May, and there was this very large, colorful fellow from Chicago who stood up and said, think of me as that yellow canary going into the Tokyo subway. I'm a fireman in Chicago. And you remember the media pictures from Tokyo that the emergency response teams had the military, the mop gear, and they, but they didn't have any detectors. So they carried the canaries down in the cages, and if they died, well, of course, you know, the bio agent canary is not going to die right off. And this policeman knew all of that, or fireman knew all of that. And he went on to tell the story if there had been a poisoning extortion attempt in Chicago a couple of years ago, and they had pre-arranged with the base commander of the local uh, uh, guard facility to use one of their Fox fighting detection vehicles uh, in the event of such an incident. And this incident occurred, and they went down to get it, and they couldn't get it uh, because this was undue interference with the military in the affairs of the state. And it required uh, you know, an afternoon of phone calls from mayors and governors and the like. And it finally got released. Of course, by then, it was much too late to do any good in the particular incident. But in the, in the more general debate that went on with the counterterrorism bill passed last year, this is an unresolved issue. The military has been given the charge to assist through the weapons laboratories in the development of detectors suitable for civilian usage. Uh, but that's only, obviously, scraping the first layer of problems away here. Uh, and it's not redefining the national interest. I mean, I think that the national interest comes uh, in, these, in these big scenarios. I mean, where, where we face wars, where we have where we really have to face the prospect of a regional war in which an aggressor has weapons of mass destruction, that's going to change that war in some fundamental ways. Wars like that are going to become uh, significant for the reputation they create for the weapons that are used or threatened. They're going to be, they're going to, have, they're going to, they're going to have implications so far beyond the immediate issues at stake. They're going to tell people something about the reputation of the United States, its credibility as a security guarantor. They're going to provide lessons to everybody about the nature of the post-Cold War task in promoting order. Now, with that view in mind, the president's going to take a pretty odd look. I mean, we're not, we probably haven't really thought through adequately how the president, president is going to think about these choices of responding conventionally, chemically, nuclearly, plus the language rules. Um, uh, and that these are going, and, and this will invoke a debate about what national interest we have in a proliferated world. Does our national interest require that we stay engaged, that we be a, a security guarantor, that this is the means of preventing the proliferation, preventing the instabilities that generate proliferation? Or one can imagine the converse arguments very easily. Uh, and uh, this leads me to a particular reply to your question about the two MRCs. If we face two MRCs that are NBC, I think it's extremely unlikely that when the crunch comes, the United States will find itself isolated and alone. Uh, because the consequences for everybody else of a, con a crisis such as that where, where our power is eclipsed are profound. 
Japan and Germany would be the first to stand and remind us of that. Uh, but France would be there reminding, all of a sudden, reminding us of our long history of uh, cooperation and amity. Uh, I mean, China can't afford to see the United States collapse as a global security guarantor. Iran cannot see that. And I, I think that it would be a fundamental strategic miscalculation for two states to stand up and confront the United States in that way at the same time. At the current moment, at least, no one, except who, Libya and North Korea, can conceive of living in a world that's that dramatically transformed that quickly into one of a vacuum around American power. If we back out, or if we go nuclear, and I mean, that will have, I think, similar repercussions. So. Oh, go ahead, Julian. A couple quick couple points. Uh, I agree with you on your, on your civil defense preparedness, but uh, certainly the military is working it with their Kim Bio response team. You know, they were there in Atlanta and Commandant of the Marine Corps is charged with, uh, with pursuing that. Obviously, we don't have an effective civil defense program. We haven't had one since we built bomb shelters uh, you know, in the 1950s. That's just something that the American people have not typically lived with or wanted to live with. And that's going to be a whole counterterrorism. That's going to be something but on the state versus state actor, you know, you can't have it both ways. We're advocating CWC and biological warfare treaties, but you're saying we're tying our hands with a nuclear response. There's not a whole lot left, except you kind of ignored the fact that we could, if we're not, if they sicken people, we're not going to instantaneously go nuclear. We may turn off their lights. We may cause a bunch of their troops to go blind. We may uh, make their banking system not work. We have other deterrents, and that's what we're looking at as far as, you know, we don't, we're saying chemical warfare is a bad thing, biological warfare is a bad thing. There's a lot of people advocating, well, you want to keep it in case we're tit for tat. Uh, they use chemicals, we use chemicals. I think the way the military senior leadership has read the political scene is, is that we feel we've moved beyond that. We don't have necessarily to respond with a weapon or our conventional weapons are good enough that we can make a demonstration to them that, okay, you sickened a bunch of our troops. How badly do you want your lights to come back on? Maybe never. That's easy in state versus state. It's a lot harder when you start talking about state. You know, that's almost a different ballgame than we have to work on state. Comatitis, which you referred to, is, is what really hurts you there, and uh, that's where your national guards can go. I'm a little concerned about um, the concept that uh, delivery is a big problem. Tell me why this scenario won't work. Now, I guess it's part of an urban legend now, but the Iranians send over a container ship filled with the anthrax bacilli and uh, in spores, mold spores, and then just drop, float the thing around Manhattan and spray Manhattan with it and then leave the wide open ocean and about 8 million people die. I mean, why do you need a massive, massive delivery system under those kinds of circumstances? You don't need a massive delivery system. I mean, system. so, de so you clearly you defined a delivery system is what I mean. So mm -hmm. the military. I'm not arguing that you need that. I think for some of those scenarios where you want to inflict battlefield defeat, you have to have battlefield weapons. And that may not mean, I mean, that may be upwind, that may be an RPV. But why doesn't that scenario work? It might work just perfectly. But it won't work at all if the Iranians don't know that the spores have to be of a certain size. And if what they do is go out and buy, the literature is full of this, right? All you need is an ag as a, a fogger, an agricultural fogger, or you know, a, uh, a spray plane. Crop duster. Crop duster, thank you. Crop duster. <coughs> The crop duster nozzles don't produce the spores in the size that make them respirable in the lungs. It took the Iraqis three years to figure out how to work with the crop dusters they had to get it to the spore size that was respirable. So, yeah, it's doable, but you got to know that it's doable only in a certain way, and you got to know what you tinker with to get it right. It's not that hard, but the fact that it's a barrier has been relevant to the past. It was relevant to the Iraqi program. 
Uh, along those same lines, could you tell us something about how technology is changing? I mean, what is it that's new about a lot of this stuff? Is anthrax is, you know, we've understood that for 150 years probably, and nobody's ever used it as a weapon of war, as far as I know. So, what's what's going on that's fundamentally changing this issue problem? Three things. First of all, the technology of delivery. Which is? Cruise missiles and RPVs. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think cruise missile proliferation is much more significant to this problem than ballistic missile proliferation. Um, secondly, it's the technology of uh, production. It's uh, bioengineering makes it possible to produce toxins, huge quantities of toxins in 24 hours. Before, you needed to cook away large fermenters, long periods of time. Uh, and if you were going to use it as a military instrument, then you needed to stockpile it and get it ready. Well, do all that today. You just produce a lot of them. Um, third, the technology <coughs> is, it's not that it's changing, it's becoming everywhere. I mean, it's, it's dual-use technology. Bio-warfare production technologies of the 40s and 50s, well, uh, they, I guess it was dual use. The Brits produced uh, anthrax in the 40s in a factory that made soap. soap. And in fact, they made soap the rest of the time. But they made little bars of anthrax. And these were to be dropped in the fields where cattle were eating. So it was an anti-animal bomb. Maybe they were anticipating that cow disease. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> But, but today, of course, the technology is in the pharmaceutical industries, it's in the fertilizer industries, it's in the medical, it's in university research labs, it's on the internet where you don't even need to have the equipment in your lab. So three changing technical factors. The, the notion that some people say uh, technology is going to produce a, a terribly lethal novel agent, something that makes anthrax look <laughs> arcane. Uh, and the argument has been made that AIDS uh, was a mistaken attempt to create a, a population bomb to kill blacks in Africa. And the genetic engineering of the 1970s made that when AIDS certainly began to appear. It may have, in fact, began to appear in the 50s. But in the 70s, when it really emerged, uh, genetic manipulation was not capable of doing that. It probably is today. Identifying, well, now there is no such thing as a black race or a white race. Most of us in this room are Caucasian heritage, but come from all sorts of different racial groups. And in any case, our racial characteristics are a mix of, of genetic materials. Uh, and almost nowhere in the world do you find racial groups that are entirely separate in terms of their genetic makeup. But it is certainly within, going to be within the reach of science my, the advice I have from the technical community is that we're not talking 50 years into the future, we're talking 5 to 10, to create diseases that kill on the basis of singular genetic attributes. To create a disease that kills everybody whose earlobe attaches, as opposed to those who have unattached earlobes. The fundamental distinction in humans. So, so one gene. Then, then the world might not be survivable. But what, what do you say? I mean, is that your answer to this skepticism that? I mean, we keep hearing all sorts of different things that are threats to the world. There's info war and there's biological <laughs> warfare and chemicals and everything like that. And none of it ever happens. Terrorism is not much of a big deal. So how is this different from all the other threats? Well, uh, I, you raise a very good point. I, good point. I am a part of, and I have difficulty with it because my usual mode in, in this community is to quell the hype. There was a lot of hysteria about this problem, both the terrorism problem and the state problem. A lot of hysteria, but the hysteria doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, and I think, if anything, we've blown the state problem a little, I mean, it's, it's not clear to me that Saddam Hussein has operational concepts to use, the, but he could very quickly. And there is, I'm trying to motivate people to do the reasonable things to close our windows of vulnerability so that it will not be seen to be useful. But 
our vulnerabilities are pronounced on the BW side at the state level. They are well studied by aggressors. And there's a lot of evidence that aggressors are climbing that learning curve. So that it didn't happen in the Nazi era, in World War I, uh, that we haven't seen say that we haven't seen it at the ethnic level. I'm not, true. I'm not sure that's true. There have been lots of things that have happened in history that might be explainable by this way that we haven't paid attention to. Uh, and uh, particularly for that aggressor motivated by the desire not just to acquire Kuwait, but to delegitimize a world order secured by Washington, you know, who wants to create a post-Cold War order that's post-America. Uh, nuclear weapons are going to be seen as not useful. Uh, chemical and conventional are not useful. Bio might be just the thing. Now, I'm not saying there are a lot of people out there motivated by that ambition, but it only takes one or two. And, and I don't, I think that we, we become hysterical become hysterical too often about this problem, and that gets in the way of our doing the things that, that at modest expense, with modest investment of effort, could go a long way to eliminating our vulnerability. Let me just uh, mention something, he's, too. He's, he's, he's been very patient. Uh, Brian, what I find interesting about the conversation is that I went into this with the expectation that, that bio was a different phenomenon than chemical and nuclear. And I was suspicious that all the language of nuclear issues and what struck me as really intriguing is I looked at your last two slides and I kept with this mantra in my mind that bio is different, bio is different, bio is different. And I looked at those last two slides and it struck me that if you changed, if you, if you took out the word chemical and biological and inserted the word nuclear, that that logic would hold all the way through. And I keep asking myself why that's the question and I, I have a suspicion that the problem with biological warfare is that the language slips between deterrence and using the Deterrence strategy and deterrence theory. And where it really becomes apparent to me is when we talk, for example, in the operations center. And we agree that if a state were to confront the United States directly on this sort of issue, uh, that we would confront it and we could use a whole, whole panoply of issues of, of options to deal with that kind of state. So we say, well, a state wouldn't be dumb enough to do that, and if it did, we know how to deal with it. Then on the other hand, we say, but states could possess this sort of technology as a way to deter us. And I keep coming back to the nuclear language. States are not dumb enough to use nuclear weapons, because if they do, uh, the consequences are obvious to all. But there is enormous value to all ranges of states, whether it's the superpowers, the medium range, the medium range states, or the smaller states, the Iraqs, the Iraqs, the North Koreas, for whom possession but not, not use of nuclear weapons is a very, potentially very valuable instrument of diplomacy. I think you're making the same argument. I think you're saying that the use of biological weapons is one which would impose upon the aggressor whether directly or indirectly, whether immediately or in a, in a longer sense, catastrophic consequences. I, my sense is that if we are involved in any kind of crisis in the state and people start dropping like flies for any peculiar reason, we're going to suspect the worst and we're probably going to act accordingly. We may be wrong, but yeah, that's, that's the great apologize. But the possession of those weapons would be a fundamental value to those states because it would give them the ability to make us think and so I think, I find this is just a superb presentation because it goes through and sort of attacks a lot of the shivers of, of thinking about bio warfare. So but but I think with it, maybe it's really fuzzy because it shifts between the theory of how one possesses and doesn't use these weapons for insurance reasons and how one uses them in, in an operational system and strategy. And I think the language, I'm not saying here is necessarily, but the conversation in the room is, is shifting always between those two issues. And I think if you stay on the, on the theory side, I think it looks just like nuclear weapons. I think maybe on the operational <coughs> strategic side, maybe it is a different phenomenon. But I think that's how I'm trying to so distinguish that. And I don't know what your, your reaction or thought is. Well, it's perhaps uh, an indirect reaction, but it's that uh, I think it's the uh, indicative of the degree to which nuclear thinking came to so much dominate all of our understanding about what shapes the behavior of our strategic competitors. And nuclear weapons certainly have come to do that over the last two decades, probably three. Uh, and 
the language that I tried to invoke in writing those seven strategic imperatives was the classic language of strategic studies. Uh, it's what states do to one another, shaping choices, shaping perceptions, shaping risk perceptions, um, dissuading, cajoling, coercing, deterring, uh, and the particular American experience of nuclear weapons becoming so paramount in our vocabulary and concepts of strategic behavior among states during the Cold War, it gets in the way. Uh, so yes, I would say that I do invoke, this does look a lot like the nuclear problem because we've made the nuclear problem look like everything else. And I think that the same, the, the argument you made about, you could switch out all of those words, you switch out uh, nuclear and put in, or switch out bio and put in nuclear in each case, it would be true for conventional and chemical too if those were within their reach, the militarily decisive effect. Uh, so, kind of side. I'm sorry. Barry, I, 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 I think we have to take up your offer to let people go. Right, it's more. 4 o'clock. Uh, thank you very much, Brad, for your, your time. Uh, anybody wants to hang around and talk a little bit longer, we can do that. You want to let her come?